we call wild rice because we're wild. <laughs> because who wants to be boring when you can be wild, wild. right? <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Yana TV. Today, our guest is Glenn Goey, who is one of the Singapore's leading film and theater directors. Glenn, I'm so happy to have you in the studio again. <laughs> Because what the audience doesn't know, I actually interviewed Glenn, I think it was eight years ago, and it was my first interview professionally, and it lasted for two hours, <laughs> and my team was mad. They're like, Jana, how are we supposed to cut it now? <laughs> so today I promise to keep it much shorter, okay? Thank you for having me again, Jana. <laughs> and it has been so many years, and I'm just so, so excited also to hear what happened during this time. Yes. But, and then I would love to start from the beginning. Because you have a great story, and this is what I really would like to share today. So, born and bred in Singapore, yes. right? Grew up here, yes. and as people know, that in the theater yeah. and cinematography mm. industry. And tell us a little bit, um, what happened when you were growing up, and where did you go from Singapore? <laughs> <laughs> so, I spent the first 20 years of my life in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, studying in a local school. And I went. Which school? Um, it was uh, ACS, mm -hmm. and I went to um, serve my national service. And then, as soon as I completed my national service, I went to England, and I lived there for twenty years. So I went to England to study. I, I did a degree in Cambridge um, in history, and then I went to drama school to study acting, which was my passion all my life. Um, I started directing theatre since the age of eleven. I was given that opportunity in my school. Um, I had great teachers who believed in me and who wanted to give me um, the platform and wanted to give me, help me build my confidence in theatre. Um, so I had great opportunities since I was young. But of course, um, growing up in, in Singapore, in Asia, in the early 80s, it was impossible to even dream of a career in the theatre because there was no professional theatre companies in the early 80s in Singapore. Theatre as a career was just non-existent. That all changed 10 years later. But when I was um, going to drama school, of course, I had a lot of parental objection. I was just going to ask, <laughs> your parents react? I said, mom and dad, I want to be a movie star or film director in the 80s. And they're like, be a doctor, please. <laughs> be a doctor, be a <laughs> lawyer, yeah, be an baker. engineer or an right. accountant or a exactly. So anyway, um, yeah, my, my, my parents were very disappointed when I wanted to, to go to drama school. But I, I told them that I'll just do a year of drama school and then after drama school, I'll become an accountant, which is what nearly happened because after I graduated from drama school, I then applied very dutifully because I had promised my parents that I would, since I wasn't going to become a lawyer, I should become an accountant. So I applied at that time. There were big eight big agencies, eight big accounting firms in the world. And I applied to, and I got a place in one of them. And I was okay. about to start at Deloitte in 1988, uh, when I got a call from my agent um, to audition for a part um, to, to play the leading role in a play called Monsieur Butterfly, M. Butterfly was uh -huh. called by David Henry Huang. And then the rest is history because then I, I, I got the role opposite Anthony Hopkins um, in 1989. <laughs> and then after that, I decided no more, no more turning back, <laughs> no, <laughs> no more accounting. Back. No more turning back. Um, I really, really wanted to pursue acting um, and theatre as my career, and which is what I did. And I've been doing it for the past 33 years. So here you are, a young, uh, talented, impressionable yeah. boy, yeah. living in London, yes. right? And going for this career and wanting to be a superstar. Uh, how was the reality? The reality is that A, I am a Chinese actor in 19... 90, so we're talking about 33 years ago, right? Okay. I had just done a West End role opposite Anthony Hopkins. Um, I had my name splashed all over the newspapers. And when the role ended after seven months, because Anthony Hopkins went off to do Silence of the Lambs. Yes. I was unemployed. <laughs> I was totally unemployed and unemployable because 33 years ago, they did, there wasn't diversity yeah. in casting, there wasn't colorblind casting, there wasn't this whole thing about inclusiveness uh, of different races in, 
in TV shows, in, in soap operas, on, and especially on television. And certainly well, now not, you see it everywhere. Now right? you see that it you, everywhere. You see it in yes. every James Bond. That's right. But yeah, now you see now it's all <laughs> multiracial, right? 33 years ago, the reality was not like that. Right. And I was unemployed. And so as a result of that, I decided to set up my own theater company. And I set up my own theater company. In London? In London. Okay. In order so that I could give jobs, create jobs for um, Asian actors mm -hmm. and find Asian stories to tell, Asian stories which had never been told in the UK at the time, um, and also to provide jobs for Asian actors. And that's what I did. I set up my own theater company. It was very, very difficult. It was very, very difficult. But um, nevertheless, I pursued it for seven years. Um, uh, at, after seven years, I decided to make my first feature film. It's called Forever Fever. Forever Fever, yes. yes. And it was bought by Miramax. Um, and then I signed on with Miramax for five years, um, from 1998 to 2003. So I was, I, was, I was living between London and New York at the time, yeah, after making my first feature film. And it, so how have always been working in New York? Was it, it was like similar? It's very difficult. Very difficult. It was very, very difficult because you, 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 you face different challenges. Um, in the film industry because they're developing stories all the time. They have stacks, stacks of scripts and men, a stable of writers and directors that they're working with all the time. And so sometimes they have a hundred projects in development and maybe only one project gets made. Mm -hmm. So it's what they call development hell. So I was in development hell for five years. And after those five years, I decided I was invited back to come back to Singapore to direct um, a National Day Parade. So that's quite an honor. I mean, it's, it's a yeah. big thing. Yes. You know? So, so at the time, it was um, um, the you know the National Day Parade is always run by the Ministry of Defense. Yeah. And so they invited me to come back to direct um, my first National Day Parade in two thousand and three. And I and then and then when they after they invited me to direct it, they kept me on for another four years. <laughs> So it's the Singapore that kept you here. Okay. So, you know, from, from being unemployed. Yes, now you're very, <laughs> warm, very welcome. Yes. <laughs> and at the same time, my friend Ivan Heng had just started his own theatre company yes. um, called Wild Rice. Ivan invited me to, to join Wild Rice. And I've been now with Wild Rice for 22 years um, as their co-artist artist director. And I direct about two or three plays for them for the past 22 years. And I mean, I know well dress, I know yeah. the work, and I yeah. love what you guys yeah. doing. But maybe just let's tell our audience a little bit what it is, guys, you're focusing on, right? Yes. Because I mean, you're a very unusual yes. theater company. <clears throat> yes. So in my experience, I mean, one of the best, maybe the best in Singapore, if I can say Thank so you. myself. Thank you very much. What are you focusing on? I think one of our main aims is to be a mirror to society. Mm -hmm. So whatever we do on stage, whenever whatever we put up, um in the theater always needs to reflect what is happening in society. Singapore society. In Singapore society mm -hmm. in particular, because theater is such a local thing. Um, and so we want to reflect um, what are the, the concerns and what are the problems and what are the issues and the conversations that people are having in kopitiams, in food courts, in their homes. Um, so we always work with writers and we always like to do new writing if possible and when we do a classic which um i i do very often i always m find a classic which reflects what is happening in mm -hmm. today's society and i always try to bring the classic back to singapore in other words i will always try to um contextualize it but to a Singaporean, culture, yes, Singaporean yes. Singaporean context and culture. That's right, you that's right. You guys use dialect. Yes, I mean, use dialect. I use dialect. I don't languages. understand. <laughs> because they are, they are like a local dialect. Yes. <laughs> so, 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 so we use Singlish. But you know, in Singapore, um, our audiences are local. Yeah. And, and they want to, to come to the theatre to hear and to hear all the, the different um, issues which, which everyone in Singapore is talking about. And so even when we do a classic, we recontextualize it to a Singapore context. So we could be doing a Henrik Ibsen. We did Public Enemy, Enemy of the People, which is a 130-year-old play. Oh. Right, right. That was a great You know, one. it's a 130-year-old yeah. play, mm -hmm. but we set it in Singapore. We use Singlish so that our audiences feel that they can connect with us and that we can engage them on 
um, on a very, very personal level, you know, rather than doing something which um, is too um, highbrow. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, 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 so that is um, um, Wild Rice's mission to, you know, to, to make plays which are accessible and which connect with our audience. Relatable. Yes, right? absolutely. So yes. As yes. People. Yeah. And we are always um, challenging. Huh? We're always um, provocative mm -hmm. and sometimes controversial. Yep. But, <laughs> but always entertaining. Yes. Always <laughs> entertaining because you have to draw your audiences in. Before you can become controversial or provocative, you need to entertain your audiences first <laughs> and foremost. Yes. So that's what we do. I mean, I suppose you can say that's our, our, it's our re raison d'etre, but it's also our signature. Yes. I love that. Something very, very local. It's, um, it's, it, which is why we're called wild rice, because A, we're wild, <laughs> because who wants to be boring, right? <laughs> <laughs> who wants to be boring when you can be wild, wild. right? <laughs> and of course, rice, because rice is Asian and rice is a staple of our culture, mm -hmm. you know, um, whether you're Malay or Indian or Chinese, we all eat rice and rice is the staple of our diet and it's a necessity. And so we always believe in wild rice that art is also a necessity. Mm -hmm. We need art to survive, we need art to grow, we need art to feel alive. And that's why um, we call ourselves wild rice. <laughs> um, just sort of, you know, redirect as the question, yes. since you were talking about your life and yes. also your experience, like in yes. London and in yes. New York at that time, and how difficult it was, right, also for a person who is from Asia yes. to, to make it on those stages. And then you came back and now you're doing what you're doing for yes. all these years. I'm just curious when you look around also in the world, like, do you think it is changing? Like, do, because right now, what were they, the Michelle, Michelle, yeah, Michelle Yeo, yeah. right? Yes. Just won the, the Oscar uh, the best as the yes. first Asian, yes. uh, best actress yes. who ever had it. Yeah. So do you think, let's say if it's now a person at, at the beginning of their career who is mm. Asian, do they have, I mean, they would definitely have more opportunities. Absolutely. But do they, like, how now. far can you go? What do you think? <laughs> I think the sky's the limit, you know, the sky's the limit. I mean, um, so the, the writer of the movie, Everything Everywhere, I mean, he, one of the writers and directors, he's Asian as well. And he won the Oscar for best, I think, I think director or, you know, for, um, and writer. He, they won so many awards. So I think the sky's the limit. I think, um, the world has become smaller in a way mm -hmm. because of the internet. Um, the, the, the world has become more accessible to everybody, right? And I think it's wonderful, you know, even with social media, with TikTok and, with Instagram, people feel so connected to various parts of the world. You know, you can, you can connect with so many different types of people and the exposure is so amazing. So I think the internet has changed things a lot. And, you know, if you want to date it, I mean, I suppose the past 20 years. Yeah. But in the nineties, which is when I was growing up as an actor and as a theater director in, in London, it was very, very difficult. It was a different world altogether. The internet has changed things completely. And I think um, people are more exposed and people want to see different cultures and different races and different genders represented on television and in the cinema. Yeah, so I think that has changed things a lot. Do you think we have enough original content being created in Asia and specifically Singapore? Um, I think Korea is definitely in the forefront. Okay. Here, yeah, mm -hmm. and of course, Japan had its wave in the 80s and 90s. So in the 80s and 90s, it was J-pop. Um, and, you know, all the games like Nintendo, I mean, Pokemon is still from Japan. So, I, I mean, you, you, Japan had its wave and, and, and Japan is still producing wonderful movies and wonderful anime. But of course, now Korea is in, is in the forefront, right? With, um, all the BTS and Blackpink and all the rock and pop bands that they have. Um, and all their TV series and all their films. So I think um, it's wonderful what's happening, that people are taking notice of Korean dramas, and especially during COVID, right? Yes, yes, watching yes, Squid very Game, right? very, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. And, Squid Game, and because yes. of COVID, everyone's watching Korean soap opera, yes. right? All over the world, people are watching Korean soap opera. And so I think that's amazing. And you know, they're creating a lot of content, but there is, um, there is Korea has its own population, which supports them, 
right, which supports all their local content. And um, Korea also has all their very, very powerful TV stations, mm -hmm. media stations. Who help to distribute it, right? Yes, yeah. and who help finance mm, the most important as well, part, right? Yes. So it's amazing. Yes, original content from Korea. You, yeah. So going back to Singapore. I would just, yes, can we yes, do it in course, Singapore yes. on this level? And yeah. how to take? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I have to say, plus, you know, we are a very, very small country. Um, so the population doesn't quite support it because it's very expensive to make TV shows and to make films. Very expensive. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the capital needed for these productions yeah. are, are not cheap. Um, so, and because our population is also multiracial and multilingual, so which population do you make films for? So it's, it's, it's very, very difficult given the size of our population. Um, but that's not to say you can't do it. You mm -hmm. know, I, I think if you come up with a very original story, um, which has never been seen before, originality is, you know, it's, it sells itself. So I, I, I don't think it's impossible. Um, I think it's difficult, um, because of the expense involved. What do you think needs to change? I, I mean, the arts definitely need a lot of support. Um, not just financial, but also emotional, emotional me me yes. mental support. Um, I, I, I think that, um, education is very important, that people need to realize that arts is as important as science, mm -hmm. as important as economics for the future of this country. You know, we can't just survive on on economics, we can't just survive on science. You know, um, we we need all these different things, and the arts needs to be seen as valid, as and as important as integral to the future of any community, of any society, of any country. So I think education it needs to start with education. It needs to start from schools, um, and um, so I, I I think it needs to start from there. Yeah. And then, of course, parents need to be educated to realize that the arts is an important part of our society. So it needs self education and, of course, um, financial backing um, and uh, support, I think, from not just, not just the government, but I think from the private sector. Yeah. I, I think the private sector also needs to come in on this. Wild Rice has been going on now for 23 years. We would not have been able to continue um, without the support of private individuals. Mm -hmm. Private individuals who saw our work and who believed in our work and who, who could see that um, it's important for us to continue. And we could not have done it without the help of private individuals, you know. Of course, the government had help, helps us, but, but to sustain what we do, uh, we need a lot of help from private individuals. So I think the private sector also needs to step up to the plate <laughs> when it comes to film production and, and TV production too. Private sector, here's the message. <laughs> so I know that there are some things that are close to your heart and you have been like a quiet advocate yes. for this for a while and yes. you don't often talk about it yes. on camera. Yes. So well, let's talk about it. Okay. 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 Let's, talk about it. let's talk about yes. it. Uh, my question yes. would be for you as, mm. I mean, if, if I may say so myself, probably mm -hmm. one of the leaders in the LGBT community, because of also the work that you do, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and yeah. you blend in different world. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not yeah. entirely how you identify, mm. but it is a part of your life it's, and then you do all also it everything is else. a very important part so, of my life. And, and it's an important part of your life. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. So, and you are at a stage where you can talk about yes. it. So we're yes. talking about it. So, I mean, <laughs> um, the community, um, and, and I've been involved in that, in this fight to repeal 377A. 377A, and it's a law which discriminates and criminalizes gay sex, mm -hmm. um, pe pe uh, people who indulge in gay sex. Um, and we fought to get it repealed for the past 15 years. So since 2007, we have fought and we m finally got it repealed last year in August 2022 after 15 years of fighting to get it repealed so but you did it but we did this it the most important but, thing it was but, 100 years yes of one way yes. and you changed it to a different yes. way which is quite impressive um i i i, I didn't w believe that it would happen in my lifetime yeah. to be honest with you because we are a very conservative society and i understand that 
understand that we are multiracial and that we're multi-religious. So there are many segments of society that a government has to, you know, balance, Figure, ba- ba- balance and, and consider. Exactly, yes. Exactly. So I, I totally understand it. So I never really believed that it will happen in my lifetime. But um, it did happen last year and I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, it doesn't mean that the fight to, um, the fight for um, equality has ended. No, in fact, the fight, the real fight really begins now because we need to fight for equality. We need to fight for um, greater inclusiveness and diversity in our society. Um, we need to fight against bullying mm. at schools. We need to fight against discrimination at workplace and um, even at home, violence at home, which happens against the LGBT community. Um, we seldom hear about these stories because we're so Asian. Because, because when these things happen to us, we feel shameful. Um, so this is something very much um, close to my heart. And um, I, 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 do, I do want to, to talk. I, I, I like to talk about it because... At least to raise awareness. Yes, right? to raise so awareness. No, it is happening. Exactly. And it also depends on every individual. That's right. right. So because it is about, about being kind to each other. Yes. I, I think the, the more I talk about it, the more people like myself, um, um, we, we talk about it, we bring awareness to people, we educate people um, so that people know that it does exist and that we have to fight this discrimination. Just like um, any other discrimination. Yes, yes. It, 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 we're in the 21st century and Singapore is a first world developed nation. You know, we, we, we need to fight for those minorities, those who are, have no voice and those who are marginalized. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your heart out. I can see you are very passionate about it. Um, I'm just curious, yeah. right? When you were sharing all those stories of your younger self, yes, living in London and yes. New York, and it was entirely different time. Yeah, and you did. You made the choices you did in yes. the way how you did them. Yes. However, yes. my question is: when you look back, yes, would you have made different choices? Wow! No, I, I, I. I... I I made the I, I made the choices at the time and they were the right choices to make. Um I, I'm glad I I pursued my dream. Um there were many difficult years, of course, especially the years when you're unemployed as an actor, um, or even as a theater director or a, a theater producer. It was very difficult living in the UK in the eighties and nineties. Um people were not used to seeing an Asian face step um show up for an audition. Right, because uh, the role is for a Caucasian actor. So why is an Asian actor showing up for an audition? It was very hard to educate people to 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 try to let them see that there are different ways of casting, you know, and 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 how important it was for audiences to go on go to the theater to see a multiracial um, cast being represented um, to reflect the society, because. You know, if you go to a city like London or, or New York, it's so multiracial, yes. you know. So it, it's very important for us to see that representation on stage and on television and in film. In the 90s, it wasn't like that. I, I didn't realize it at the time. I was a young, um, you know, very uh, impressionable and very optimistic actor. Um, but it's okay because I set up my theater company, which... Um, try to address those issues. Uh, and it was the right thing at the right time. So okay, no yeah, regrets. No, a, 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 no, a, a, absolutely a, 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 no, no regrets. And of course, um, I know one question you, you, you would like to ask me, why did I come back? Yeah, <laughs> thank you for asking. Why, why, why did I come back after living in the UK for 20 years? And um, I was very happy living there in spite of all the problems I faced as a Asian actor. Right. And as an Asian director. Um, but I felt that when the call came to come back, it was very, very strong. And I felt that I could make a bigger difference here, that there were many directors there. There were many other Asian actors, but I felt that I could make a bigger contribution if I came back to Singapore because Singapore at the time, the theater industry and the film industry were very, very young. Right, very, very young, and I felt that I could make a difference if I came back. And I think more importantly, the stories that I told through theater and through film were original, 
And there were local stories. There were stories which were waiting to be told because we get so much films from Hollywood, so yeah. much uh, TV content from on, on the streaming channels, right? We get so much of that, but we get so little of our own stories being told and being represented. And I just felt that I wanted to tell those stories from my own perspective and from my own little, um, you know, little world. I, I, I wanted to tell those stories because those stories weren't being told. So that's one of the reasons why I came back and I just felt that um, my life was more meaningful um, if I told um, those local stories. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> I love me. your life story, <laughs> your way of telling stories, the stories you are going to create in oh, the future. Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Thank, thank, thank you. you for being on the show. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> That was Glenn Goey on Yana TV with us today. And Glenn and I would love to hear from you. Let us know in the comments what is happening for you when you're listening to this interview and perhaps especially if you're in a theater or film industry. If you happen to be an Asian and you are maybe starting your career right now, how is your experience? Let's have this conversation. And I'm so grateful to the Muse Studio for hosting Yana TV. So thank you for having us here. And the most important, guys, remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel and share this episode with friends. I'm going to see you next time. I would make you more money than an actor. You see? <laughs> and at least you can eat for the rest of your yeah. life, right? You can we don't have to feed you. <laughs> yes.